Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Welcome in. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Thanks for listening to the show. Apple's hitting some speed bumps right now. iPhone sales in China fell by a whopping 24% over the first six weeks of the year. The gadget is struggling to replicate its usual success in the world's largest smartphone market. The company's also lost the title of the world's most valuable company to Microsoft. It was removed from Goldman Sachs' list of high-conviction investments. Evercore ISI's tactical outperform list it was dropped from. It is now the time to buy. Apple's dominance or Apple's resiliency has been questioned in the past. And somehow they respond with their 2 billion installed operating systems. And it's the services that have the fat margins. Will they be able to continually go to that well? It's a big question. Um, I like Apple a lot more at 165 than I did at 195. Law of big numbers. I don't like Apple as a growth stock as much as I like it as a way for me to make income from using options. I think it's a big company that won't fall too far, and it's a big company that won't go too far at this point in time. They've taken the car off the table, so there's no new market for them to go into except for wearables, of which some of their wearables are, to be quite honest with you, I I think on the attractive side of the thought. Um, Will they come out with a ring? It's expected that they will. Will they come out with glasses? Similar to Meta's? It's expected that they will. Does this mean you should buy them? No, 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 no. That's really, really taking a leap of faith on can they be any more than a 10% grower? I question that. And like I said, this is a company I ultimately like and I own, but I own it for the income reasons other than for the growth reasons. You're going to probably come out with a home pod with a screen that's expected. So think of a speaker with an iPod built into it. That could also be used for all your other Siri ideas. In June of this year, at their developers conference, they're probably going to announce a lot of AI software to develop apps around for new phones in the fall. That should be a catalyst. Should be. Will it be a catalyst that gets them to 250? I don't think so. But some of the more interesting areas that they've been able to succeed in, the watch, no one really expected them to succeed in, and now it's the most the best-selling watch in the world as far as volume, volume, volume goes. Is it a Rolex? No. But every time I go to the gym, I turn my watch on and I count my steps. I count steps every day and I do it through my watch. Um, On a weird occasion, I see that my watch says someone's texted me and I'm like, oh, I need to go grab my phone. Um, It's a gadget for sure. Is it a miracle? It's not. So HomePod with a screen, a new sports app, an upgrade to iMessage security so they can keep telling the government that their iMessage is totally different than Google's iMessage. And it shouldn't be an open standard. And I bring that up because my kid was on a school bus yesterday and sharing TikToks. And every kid on that school bus is keenly aware Does that kid have a Google phone or does that kid have an Apple phone? It's a status symbol in high school. Kids love brands and they're loyal to them. And Apple is one of the most beloved brands in the the world of people under 35. I expect Apple to come up with some smart glasses, something similar to the products from Meta and Amazon. The glasses could provide audio, so you don't have to wear your AirPods. 
will take advantage of AI and cameras to identify things in the surrounding world. The device could also act as a stepping stone towards Apple's long-held dream of a truly augmented reality spectacles you can wear all day, which I'm in the camp that I don't know if I want to wear glasses all day. Um, and I certainly don't want to wear expensive glasses all day. And when I'm on a date, I don't want to wear glasses. But I'd love to have my phone in my pocket so I can check for messages when I go to the restroom. But I'm not going to be like, hey, honey, I need to go to the restroom. I'll, let me put my glasses on. Wearable devices work well in the business world. The division that includes Apple Watch and AirPods now accounts for 10% of Apple's revenue, up from less than 5% a decade ago. Wearable devices help the company reach new customers, boost growth, and keep people locked into the ecosystem, which is the value of owning shares of Apple. The company isn't actively developing a ring, but I think they will. There's certain people within the walls of Apple's campus promoting the idea. The glasses are in an exploratory phase as a technology investigation amongst Apple's hardware division. Meta's Ray-Ban Meta, and again, I say Meta. I wish I wish they didn't change the name. Who's just call it Facebook? Because you know Facebook a lot better than you know Meta. Um, their Ray-Ban glasses are pretty cool. It's the first product that I've ever said Mark Zuckerberg has helped to work on that's pretty cool. The ring could be focused on health and fitness. There are many people who buy the Apple Watch for health tracking and health tracking alone, like me. They want to monitor their heart rate, their blood oxygen saturation, their calories burned, their steps taken. I, I can't really come up with a reason to own an Apple Watch otherwise. And then, you know, there's messaging and that weird time where I'm on a soccer pitch and I need to call someone and my phone is way back in the car. Some people prefer traditional watches. I get that. Or some people don't like wearing watches at all. Or there's too many freaking fragging cords in your bedroom or too many freaking fragging cords in your bedroom uh, kitchen tied towards charging things. A watch is a low-cost way to gather key healthcare data without the need. I'm sorry, not a watch, a ring. It's a, a way of tracking all this data on you without a full-blown watch. Samsung and Aura Health already have shown this notion is feasible. Aura has turned the concept into a big enough business that it'll be mulling an IPO on a ring. Situation with glass is similar. True augmented spectacles, ones that would meet Apple standards for visual quality, performance, battery life, and size, are likely still several years away. But you're seeing ambitious projects and product from Amazon and Meta. Amazon's got the Echo Frames. Meta has the Ray-Ban Smart Glasses. Apple's at a much more attractive point to trade. But when it gets to 195, it's at a point where you go, how much growth do they really have in this $2 trillion, $3 trillion company? You have to ask yourself hard questions when you own stocks. Yeah. You can find me online at Rob Black Show. I got a big event coming up March 23rd in the East Bay, Lafayette. It's a retirement event on a Saturday. Sign up at robblackshow.com. You may be decades away from retirement and feeling overwhelmed. You should be starting to craft your retirement plan. Some smart decisions now can make a huge difference in the kind of retirement you enjoy. So set aside the morning of March 23rd from 10 a.m. till noon when two of the Bay Area's leading financial voices will be in Lafayette to help guide you down the right path. Learn the next chapter, Crafting Your Retirement, at a seminar hosted by EP Wealth's Stephanie Richmond and Rob Black. Certified financial planner Stephanie Richmond will show you how to reduce risk and generate secure income in retirement, plan for long-term care, learning when to take Social Security, and more. Rob will discuss the economy and the stock market. If you're looking to retire better and you have at least $500,000 in investable assets, this live seminar is for you. That's Saturday, March 23rd, 10 a.m. to noon at Don Tatson Hall in the Lafayette at library space is limited so sign up today at robblackshow.com that's robblackshow.com robblackshow.com credit scores let's talk credit scores today they are decreasing as a group for the first time in a decade as more borrowers are falling behind on payments this is kind of one of those four horsemen of the apocalypse of uh-oh 
the economy is slowing down, the economy is cracking. If we don't spend and support the economy, then corporations that live in the economy aren't able to use their marketing to get you to buy their product. The national average for a credit score fell to 717. Credit scores have steadily improved for a decade, but increases in missed borrower payments and rising consumer debt levels are starting to take a toll. I feel this at times. I've got an app on my phone, creditkarma.com or Credit Karma. Um, that's with a C and then a K. Credit with a C, Karma with a K. Uh, I find it to be very useful. And one of the things it tells me is anytime someone opens a credit card in my name, it warns me, did you do this? It's kind of a credit monitoring service without being a credit monitoring service, if you know what I'm saying. The average credit card utilization was 35% up 30 from 33% a year earlier. How much of your credit cards are you using? If it's a $10,000 limit and you're using $5,000, you are using 50% of your ability. So the average credit card utilization is up to 35% from 33% a year earlier. And the share of borrowers with a 30-day pass notice against their credit accounts also higher. The national Average credit score, which has steadily increased over the last decade, fell to 717 from a high of 718. That's not a big drop, is it? The first time in well over a decade that the score's gone down. Now, keep in mind that our government does some things on occasion where it makes it easier, like you can improve your credit score by adding rent to it and things like that. During the housing crisis more than a decade ago, 2008, average credit score fell to 686. There's a lot of, there's a big number of increases in foreclosures. That ticked higher until COVID-19 and the pandemic hit when a government stimulus program gave people extra cash and they paid down the credit cards with it. Let's go back to that utilization rate. You should never, ever go above 30% utilization. 18% of borrowers have more than a 30-day pass due. That's up from 16.5% a year ago. So that's ticking a little higher, 165 to 18%. The utilization ticking a little higher from 33 to 35%. But it's telling us we're a rubber band. It's bending. And in this case, I think it gets tired and does break at some point. During the pandemic, most Americans benefited from a, a lot of safety nets. And those safety nets aren't really there at this point in time. Am I obsessed with my credit score? I am not. I have seen people obsessed with their credit score. My credit score probably ranges from 775 to 815. In the 800s, I'm particularly high. In the late 700s, I'm excellent credit. So 775 to 800, excellent credit. 800 to 815, it's just too much excellent credit. And not too much in a bad way, it's just who cares. I think credit scores are important. I think they should be shared with your loved one. I think before you get married, you should share your credit score and your credit report. You can go to annualcreditreport.com, annualcreditreport.com, and get a copy of your credit report. And both of you can do that. And if you sit down and look at each other's credit and find out if they're shoppers, they're spenders, they have a lot of credit, they have no credit. I once met a man who tried to buy a house and his mortgage lender told me, he goes, Rob, I've never seen this before in my life. I pulled his credit report and he's got nothing on it. And I think, and I'm assuming here, um, he was probably a child of a immigrant and they didn't really believe in the banking system. Or they used a different banking system than what you and I use. Because there was no record of this person on credit. Nothing. There was no marriage and divorce. There was no uh, child support payments. There was no mortgage. There was no bank accounts. I've got a bank account with Pentagon Federal Credit Union that I've had since I was probably five years old, probably one, I don't know. 
Uh, my parents opened the bank account and, and threw in a hundred dollars and then slowly but surely it's grown through the years, right? I didn't really have a need for a bank account until I was 16 when I had a job, but I had a bank account. On my credit history, it says that I've had a bank account for 50 plus years. That's cool. That's nice. Um, my kids, uh, when they turn 16, they get a credit card in their name that I'm going to support with uh, a secure card so that if they overdraw their account and forget to pay it, it'll be paid automatically from daddy's money. But that will give them a situation where they can go to a restaurant, get food, give them McDonald's. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. They can get Nikes on Amazon.com or whatever. And it shows that they're, they've been paying their bills on time. So that by the time they're 21, they will have a five-year credit history. At that point in time, I'll take the training wheels off and say, okay, I'm no longer securing this for you. I helped you get a strong credit report. Now you're going to get a better car loan and you get a better home loan. And if you go to apply for a job, One. the employer will see that you've always paid your bills on time, maybe hiring you over someone else because you paid your bills on time. I think you get the idea there. Is it perfect? No. Is it fail safe? No. But again, credit reports are important and they're getting worse in the United States. But it's not something I'm obsessive over. Like I don't have my credit score right here right now. I'm much more worried about cash in my bank account to make sure that I'm covering all my bills because I'm moving money on a pretty consistent basis from high yield cash account into my checking account. I never want that checking account to balance because then my credit score might take a hit. You can see where I'm going out with that. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Big event coming up on the 23rd of this month. It's in Lafayette, California. You can sign up for the retirement seminar at Rob Black Show. Com. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archive podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. Welcome back in. Rob Black and your money. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Show dedicated to getting into retirement. We hit a lot on the stock market. We also focus on the economy. We hit on insurance. Some financial myths, maybe. Hints, tips, tricks. You can always be learning, in my opinion. Joining me now from briefing.com, Patrick O'Hare. I start my day every day at briefing.com. I'm there right now. It's got a lovely homepage. On the homepage, you can see page one. Page one is where Patrick O'Hare starts his day with a column that um, kind of gives us an update on what's going on in the market, what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the headline news. Patrick, your headline today is no real shocks on the surprise meter. What are we looking at right now from your insights into the economy and the market? Well, good morning, Rob. Morning. Well, I think the uh, you know the in insight on the economy is that it continues to uh, impress, really, in um, a relative sense of things. Um, still seeing some pretty good uh, labor market growth. Um, you know, not a lot of uh, undue concern there that uh, the bond is about ready to drop out of the labor market, which is obviously a very important component here as we think about the economic outlook uh, and as we think about the potential for, you know, consumer spending activity. Um, the market <clears throat> itself, uh, you know, as I think a lot of people are aware now, has been on quite a run since last October, uh, predicated in part on the idea that the Fed would be successful in engineering this so-called soft landing, where it avoids a recession and also helps bring inflation back down to the 2% target without really uh, uh, forcing a, an unraveling in that labor market. Um, so we've had prices kind of, uh, I would say, you know, run ahead of the actual data that would support that um, to a large extent. Uh, so we have an S&P 500 Right now, the market cap weighted S&P 500 trading uh, at about a 17% premium to the 10-year average, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we have an equal weighted S&P 500 trading a little bit more in line with its long-term average. So uh, a top-heavy market, if you will, that probably is in need of some um, you know, pullback, consolidation, if not a correction. <laughs> That's what I, lo I love about you, because I wanted to put it in those terms of the market weighted versus the non-market weighted and the valuations based on it. 
Um, today, we have a very important day tied towards the Fed Chairman Powell's semi-annual monetary policy testimony, where I think one day he's in front of the House of Representatives and one day he's in front of the Senate. And it seems like a time for Congress to get some some juice, to get some headlines so that they can go back to their constituents and say, look what we're doing for you. How important is his testimony? Does that? Um, I guess it'll give us insights, but is there anything else that we'll learn from it that has value, like uh, maybe a policy shift? Uh, in a word, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I say, and I'll you know, make light of it only because it it, it is unlikely that um, you know the Fed chair uh, is going to want to surprise the market um, here. Um, you okay, know, we've heard fair. from him. After that January 30, 31 FOMC meeting, uh, we've heard various Fed officials in the interim come out and, you know, kind of say the same thing. We're going to be, you know, cautious minded, wait longer. We want to see some more data before we do anything. Uh, the FOMC minutes, you know, that were released not that long ago, you know, reiterated pretty much the same points. And then even in the prepared remarks that we saw from uh, Fed Chair Powell uh, this morning, pretty much had the same color in them that he provided at his press conference. You know, the Fed is uh, cognizant that it's likely at the peak of the tightening cycle, uh, but is just, you know, wanting to see more data before it commits to cutting rates. Uh, and then, you know, balances that out with the added assertion that if the uh, data unfolded in a way where they would have to tighten again, you know, they would do that uh, in order to meet the dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability. So Fed Chair Powell will be patient in front of the House Financial Services Committee today. Um, they will have, you know, those same questions. When are you going to cut rates? Why are you going to cut rates? Uh, and I think he'll just play it very much down the middle of the road. And, uh, you know, on that note, I mean, the market itself has been, quite comfortable, it seems, uh, with that middle-of-the-road approach here. You know, with the S&P 500 trading pretty much at a record high, NASDAQ, too. Uh, and that's all happened against the backdrop where the market's rate cut expectations have been reduced from about six rate cuts before the end of 2024, which is what we saw at the start of the year, to now uh, really three priced in. A fourth is there, but the fourth rate cut is a bit of a coin toss right now. So, um, so unlikely, in my estimation anyway, that the Fed chair would say something really uh, uh, noteworthy in terms of signaling a, a policy shift relative to what he said not that long ago. Earnings season's just wrapped up, and I think profit margins were better than most on Wall Street expected. So the earnings came in a little bit better than expected. Maybe not so much with the revenue better than expected. Um, what do we have to look forward to now that earnings season is over? Do we have to wait 90 days to start the clock again on earnings season? Or is it going to be the economic data? Is it going to be the Fed? Is it going to be the presidential election cycle? What's the market mover right now? Yeah, I think the market mover uh, is the price action. Um, okay. It sounds kind of coy, and I, I realize that, but uh, but we've had such a run here. And I think you have a lot of people that are very preoccupied with that price action right now because so many people have been saying, hey, this market is due for consolidation based on the run that it's had. And you don't really, you know, we haven't really seen any material pullback. And because of that, you then get more chasing action here because people are fearful about missing out on further gains. And so I think a lot of people are going to be very tuned in kind of in this interim period because you rightfully point out we're basically done with earnings season. We're kind of in limbo there until we get to the first quarter earnings reporting period in mid-April. Um, so the you know, market will be preoccupied, obviously, with any inflation data that comes out in the interim. But really, how does the market react to anything, uh, and specifically the inflation data? Uh, how do these mega cap stocks react? What happens in the broader market when the mega cap stocks might have a day of weakness? And so we've seen more of a kind of a churning feel to things here where, uh, you know, down one day in the mega caps, up the next day, uh, whereas then you have that, you know, equal weighted S&P 500 you know, kind of just hanging in there because um, you've had some rotation, you know, out of some of these high-flying names into other low-flying names, which is a good sign for a bull market, frankly. You want to see that type of rotation, money moving within the market as opposed to exiting it altogether. And so, um, but if you see the the grouping of that so-called Magnificent Seven all come down in unison, it becomes very difficult 
for the broader market to make much headway to the upside. Um, so that'll be very important here as we, you know, move here further into the spring to see just how uh, those names react and then what happens to the broader market in turn uh, to that reaction. A lot going on. What are you looking at right now? Because you do a big picture column at the end of the week. It, I think it really complements what you do with your, your daily hits, um, with your page ones. What's the big picture thinking about as far as topics coming up? You got a lot to choose from. Yeah. Retail's, retail's slowing down. <laughs> Inflation, is it or is it not slowing down? There's a lot for you to chew on. What are you seeing? Well, that's right. That's one of the hardest parts. Of, the, of that particular job is identifying, you know, where you want to go because there's a lot to talk about. Um, and uh, we like to be brief, hence briefing.com. And so we're going to get the employment report, obviously, for the month of February on Friday. So that's a potential topic of, of interest to your um, so highlighted earlier in the show, just how important the labor market is to the economic outlook. Um, but also maybe even like looking at exploring, you know, we heard Ross stores say uh, in its, uh, earnings call or, you know, in its report that, um, you know, it's low to moderate income consumers are still feeling the heat of higher housing, food and gas costs. And, and I think that's, you know, an interesting angle here as we think about the economic outlook and we think about why, um, you know, why the market can be at an all time high while the data itself says things are pretty good, but while sentiment is kind of eroding underneath the surface, particularly at that low to, to moderate, uh, income end uh, because of the everyday costs, which, yeah, they, you know, might have been improved from, you know, more recent months, but still remain elevated relative to where they were before the pandemic. And so these people are not feeling as if they're in a better situation than, you know, that might meet the eye as we look at the stock market and some of the GDP data. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news that you can use. Um, a lot of good insights right there, and there's a lot going on, so there's a, a lot to parse through his content. Um, retail sales numbers, we saw yesterday Target say there's a slowdown in sales, but there's an uptick in profits due to margin improvement. Um, trying to get a pulse on the market is brutally tough, I believe, but when you find a source like Patrick O'Hare, continue to try to understand what they're thinking, because it'll help you. I guess calm yourself down and not freak out about a headline, either positive or negative. That's briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news that you can use. A um, couple things that I want for you to think about is an income plan and retirement. You can't really just count on Social Security in my mind. Change the topic ever so slightly. That's going to be a part of your income in retirement. One. But you also don't want to run out of money. Because Social Security is going to be about eighteen to twenty-two thousand. It's going to be a little bit more as the years go on because it's adjusted for inflation. It's going to be taxed very likely depending on what state you live in. So I look at Social Security as covering my Medicare cost. Maybe I don't look at it as covering my rent, my flights, my food, maybe my health care. You want to grow income each year. That's super important in retirement. I want to leave a legacy for my income to my children. I want to build a reserve fund for unexpected and unplanned expenses that will happen later in life. And I want to increase my spendable income every year by reducing my taxes. That's why I use a CFP. If you want to meet a CFP at an event, Stephanie Richmond's going to be with me March 23rd in Lafayette. It's retirement an income in retirement event. Sign up at robblackshow.com. This interview featured on the Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. Lots of data to look at on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, and on a yearly basis. I try to keep that in mind. You can miss a day or two, no problem. I'm surprised at how many people own individual stocks without really doing daily work on them to understand the research, to get a grasp for how things are going, to just get a pulse on the company. Weekly mortgage demand has surged 11% recently as more homes hit the spring market. That's interesting to note. Mortgages are sitting 
roughly at 7.02% right now. Again, those that's going to vary. Like gold and clay, it's going to, some people are going to get six and a half, some people are going to get eight. But the typical 30 year fixed mortgage for a conforming loan balance of 766,000, sitting right at 7.02%. Mortgage applications to purchase a home increased 11% last week versus the previous week. We are moving closer to spring. Now, again, that's tough for some people to grasp because California is going through their wet season. And we just got a dump load of snow and rain in the last week. And we're not really thinking about spring yet, but the grass is green and it's going to get greener and greener for the next couple of weeks. The average contract um, on a 30 year mortgage, I'm telling you, is 7.02%. You know, the average, con- or not the average, but the contract that I got three years ago, three and a half years ago almost, um, three years ago, is the right way of saying that probably. Uh, I got a mortgage for what's my current mortgage? Uh, 2.85, 2.86. That's pretty crazy. The only thing I regret about it is I didn't put more money on it. I moved from one house to the other, and I basically moved that loan from one house to the next. Uh, and in the process, got a better loan, a lower rate, which is pretty nuts. But also my, oh, this is worthy of note. Uh, my property taxes went up. So my mortgage went up pretty considerably. There are 14.8% more homes actively for sale in February compared with the same time last year. Home prices um, are a big factor on buying a home, but mortgage rates are as well. And number of homes for sale are important. So seeing a rise in number of homes for sale is a welcome for anyone who's considering buying a home. Welcome site for sure. Today, we saw private payrolls rise 140,000 in February, less than expected. Leisure and hospitality led with 41,000 new jobs. Construction added 28,000. Will that lead over into the Labor Department's more closely watched non-farm payrolls that comes out on the first Friday of the month? Except for this is the second Friday of the month because the first Friday happened to fall on a Monday. uh, Happened to fall on um, the first. So they gave themselves a little bit more time to put that data together. But we're going to be paying attention to the jobs numbers for sure. Nikki Haley is ending her presidential campaign, seating the GOP nomination to Donald Trump. Yesterday, I went over some basic ideas of how Trump differs than, say, Biden as a candidate for how you would approach your money. You would definitely want to think about real estate, financial service companies, banks, um, companies that have big profits. As Trump would, if he were to get back into the presidency, would likely try to cut the tax rates for corporations. You would probably be fearful of companies like Apple and Tesla, who do big business in China. Except for it was just reported that Elon Musk recently visited Donald Trump in Florida. Is there a big donation coming? What's happening there? We don't know. But if I was Elon Musk, I'd say, hey, uh, don't mess with the Chinese too much because my, my company, Tesla, does a lot of business there. Yesterday, we learned that Target launched a new paid membership program. That feels like a 10 years too late, doesn't it? So it's basically Amazon Prime. It's $49 a month or $49 a year. It's going to be called Target Circle 360. You're going to get same-day shipping on orders over $35. You get two-day shipping uh, with no delivery fees for all other orders. It's going to be a way for you to get groceries and household essentials and some of the newest must-have items delivered to your home. How many TV streaming services do we need? Max and Netflix, and they add up, right? And then how many paid memberships do we need from corporations? You got Walmart, you've got Amazon, now you have Target being thrown in there. That one feels like a miss to me. Again, I own shares of Target for the income, not necessarily for the growth. What else do we need to hit on? More millennials are getting prenups. I like this story. I'm working on this for television. Uh, We all know Michael Jordan has a prenup and Mark Zuckerberg and Kim Kardashian have prenups. We all know that, right? And we look at them as tools for the powerful and wealthy. To me, this generation is different than previous generations because this generation is the millennials who are getting married. They're getting married at a later age. So there's more workforce equality 
So women are coming to the marriage with more assets. Prenups are pretty normal. And I, I like a prenup. I like a, any conversation about money is a good one. I'm willing to talk to you about money if at all possible. And that makes sense to you. I would love to do it. Um, just something to think about. If you can't talk about money, that's a problem. And if it's a romance killer, well, romance is going to die on its own in a marriage. And divorce is becoming more of an accepted norm as we age and live in the society. Whether that's a good thing or bad thing, I don't know. But you should be able to talk about prenups, in my opinion. Um, it's an awful thing to think about, what? a marriage not working, because you didn't go into it with that thought. But it does happen. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Back Black, a big event coming up. March 23rd in Lafayette. It's going to be on crafting a retirement plan. A lot of these components work together, whether it's tax efficiency needs to work with your income and your dividends and your long-term capital gains and your required minimum distributions. Um, your healthcare plan, your long-term care plan. Do you have enough money for that? You have to budget that in maybe with a pencil, but it has to be in there. Uh, hopefully you don't have to take and use the long-term care plan, but you've got to have a plan for a long-term care plan, if that makes sense. Uh, you're seeing a little bit of a rebound today. Uh, techs are leading stocks higher. Jerome Powell is reinforcing the Fed's caution in front of Congress. You can sign up for the event in Lafayette at robblackshow.com. It's robblackshow.com. It's March 23rd, coming up right around the corner on a Saturday, 10 to noon. You may be decades away from retirement and feeling overwhelmed. You should be starting to craft your retirement plan. Some smart decisions now can make a huge difference in the kind of retirement you enjoy. So set aside the morning of March 23rd from 10 a.m. till noon when two of the Bay Area's leading financial voices will be in Lafayette to help guide you down the right path. Learn the next chapter, Crafting Your Retirement, at a seminar hosted by EP Wealth's Stephanie Richmond and Rob Black. Certified financial planner Stephanie Richmond will show you how to reduce risk and generate secure income in retirement, plan for long-term care, learning when to take Social Security, and more. Rob will discuss the economy and the stock market. If you're looking to retire better and you have at least $500,000 in investable assets, this live seminar is for you. That's Saturday, March 23rd, 10 a.m. to noon at Don Tatson Hall in the Lafayette. At Library. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com.